afternoon, Patriots. This is the American Vision, broadcast on the TLB TV network and brought to you by the Liberty Beacon Project. I'm your host, Bill Muckler, and I'm coming to you from my home studio in Cocoa, Florida, on America's beautiful Space Coast. And today I'm honored to have a very special guest, a brother Marine officer, Lieutenant Colonel David Bull Gerfine, who uh, USMC retired, and uh, David is coming to us from New York. Uh, and Bull, just I'm just honored to have you on the show, and this is really uh, exciting because I know you're so passionate about your project, the uh, United American Patriots, and as I'm learning about it, I'm really excited about it as well. well thanks so much, Bill. I appreciate you having me on, and uh, it's an honor to follow behind uh, many other great people that you've had on your show, and to be included amongst that list, uh, really something I appreciate. Uh, I also really appreciate giving the opportunity to have people who are following your show learn more about what's happening to their warriors, to the warriors that are out there going in harm's way on our behalf and maintaining the freedoms which we all enjoy here. And unfortunately, uh, they're getting caught up in political correctness, in uh, unlawful command influence, prosecutorial misconduct, and a lot of these guys are being put behind bars. So. It's important that we have support from across the country coming in on behalf of all these warriors to make sure that they're getting the rights that they protect for us. So uh, we'll, we'll talk more about United American Patriots, <clears throat> how, long, how it was founded, and uh, some of the cases that uh, we're presently supporting. Uh, yeah, that, that's great. That's exactly what we want to do. Great. So... First of all, the organization was founded back in 2005 by uh, another United States Marine, Major Bill Donahue. And uh, Major Donahue was uh, a Vietnam era Marine who was highly decorated and also highly wounded. Uh, he received multiple Purple Hearts. Uh, he is uh, someone who's been on the ground. He's been in the air. He's uh, been a door gunner. He's been uh, worked with reconnaissance units. And uh, when he came back here to the States, you know, he continued to focus on how best to support our warriors. And the Haditha Marines was really, this was a case that caught his attention because this was a case where United States Marines were accused of committing war crimes. And before the, their case even went to trial, we had United States congressmen coming out publicly uh, calling them murderers. We had them being paraded around in shackles. And uh, the realization that Major Donahue had was that these warriors should be at least presumed innocent, just as any other citizen in the United States would be prior to them going to trial. And, and then they would receive their due process and should they be found guilty? Very well, then they're found guilty. But you know, we see this rush to judgment all the time now in the United States. And it's, uh, you know, unfortunately, it falls along political lines, but many times it just falls upon a, an assumption as opposed to really dealing with what's happening. So Major Donahue said, you know, what do we do for these guys? And the one thing that had to be done was to make sure that they had a legal defense team preserving their rights when they go into trial. And as you and many other people know that who've served, we, we all serve under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And there's a convening authority that <clears throat> can come around and say, hey, we're, we're going to put together a court-martial. And uh, then that same convening authority ends up putting in place a jury. And then they've got the military comes in with various different legal teams and an attorney will be appointed on behalf of the accused. The challenge though is usually it's a lopsided game in that they, they put their best up there to prosecute what they perceive in a murder trial. And they put up some uh, other person who may or may not have had the same amount of experience. But the reality is that these individuals, they must have someone who is at least as equally strong with the same amount of uh, time in a courtroom who has seen these cases before who can present the best possible case. And again, the intent should always be to bring the truth to light. Not that this should be biased one way or the other, but 
you can't have a, an equal battle if all of a sudden you can't have the truth come to bear if one side is over is just eclipsing the other. So with that being said, Major Donahue said we, we need to make sure the funds are coming in to support a strong legal defense. And that's exactly what he did. And now some 13, 14 years later, uh, that's exactly what our organization does. And warriors who are being unjustly accused or wrongfully incarcerated for war crimes are able to submit an application to our board. Our board, which consists of uh, combat veterans, uh, attorneys, business people, entrepreneurs that present a, uh, an unbiased objective view of the situation, decide whether or not to support these cases. And per our charter and our bylaws, we only support at this time cases that are war crimes. Uh, we have had very few exceptions, I believe only one right now, of uh, extraordinary warrior, of an extraordinary warrior who uh, was accused of a crime out of beyond the, the battlefield. But for the most part, we almost always uh, support uh, war crimes. And those are considered crimes in combat. And majority of those are uh, murder, or as they're being uh, accused of, is premeditated murder. And uh, so that's sort of the broad overview of United American Patriots, uh, what we've done, what we continue to do. And to put it into perspective as to why this is so challenging, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, there were seven war crimes that were brought to trial. This month alone, I'm covering down, and I say I, the, the United American Patriots, our organization, and all the people that continue sending funding to support us, we're covering down on 22 cases with another potential three coming on board. The, the exponential growth in these accusations and the political correctness and all the rest that comes to bear and the taking of what is perceived as these laws and rights that apply here in a civilian sector and applying them onto a battlefield where situations dictate uh, instant decision making to preserve life. Uh, it's, it's really, it's gotten so lopsided and that's why we continue to raise money to support these individuals. And the mission of the United American Patriots is threefold. The first is to raise awareness. And this is where, where you come in, Bill, and, and all the people who are watching this and hopefully who will share this to make sure that everybody understands what's happening. Secondly, is we fund the legal defense. And just so you know, this can range into hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, the one case we have right now, Eddie Gallagher, who's in pretrial confinement, and we'll talk more about him in detail, his case alone, just over the past few months, has already run up a bill of about $260,000. That's an incredible amount of money, and it hasn't even come to trial yet. This is all pretrial work, of which United American Patriots has already paid $77,000. We're the sole legal support for that case, as we are with almost all of these cases. And uh, I, I, so legal financial support, I should say. We support the individuals and they choose their attorneys based upon who will best provide their defense in their cases. So the amount of money that we need to raise is significant. And that's where United American Patriots at UAP.org is constantly requesting donations to support these warriors. The third part of our mission is to help with reintegration. And again, this takes some funding as well, because many of our warriors, that they've been on the battlefield, they've engaged the enemy, and then in this case, they're accused of war crimes, and sometimes they go directly into prison. And then when all of a sudden they're released, either because we're able to get their sentences overturned, uh, we're able to get them commuted, we're able to get parole, we're able to get pardons, whatever it is, that they step out of prison and... They have challenges, just like any warrior coming back and reintegrating, but sometimes exponential. And a lot of times we see situations where their families uh, fall apart, where uh, they end up getting divorces, where a, a spouse may just simply say, I'm not waiting for you while you've got a life sentence or a 20-year sentence or even a 10-year sentence. And uh, so when they get out, they have challenges reintegrating. They have challenges finding jobs. These warriors who are now incredibly talented, uh, 
educated, successful, good leaders now have this scarlet M stamped on their forehead for murderers. And uh, this is a federal prosecution that, that it, it limits their opportunities when they get out. So we try and work with them and try to help make sure that they're integrating as best as possible. And uh, we've been able to do that for the most part with almost all of our warriors. What's, what's most important to note is that every single one of the warriors that we've supported, there has not been one case of recidivism. Not only has there not been recidivism, meaning conducting the same action which put them in prison in the first place, but they have never been accused or, uh, or incarcerated for any other crime. Now, these warriors, this is a unique situation in which they're being called out on crimes that are happening on a battlefield that would not have presented themselves anywhere else. So, again, those are the three ways that we support our warriors is that we raise awareness, we end up providing the finance for the legal defense, and we help with reintegration on the back end. And all of that takes a significant amount of money. So any contributions and support that can come from any of your listeners is greatly appreciated. And that's at UAP.org, UnitedAmericanPatriots.org. And I would recommend everybody go to the website. I know I've gone to it and I've learned so much about uh, this uh, cause and project that uh, Bull and uh, the people, and uh, Bull is actually the CEO and president of the uh, UAP, United American Patriots. So uh, you in a sense, you've dedicated your life to helping these warriors. And uh, both, I, I noticed in some of the cases, and I've actually interviewed a few of the, uh, a few of the people's uh, actually uh, parents and loved ones and so forth, uh, they're from all services and they're all uh, ranks. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely, Bill. We've, we've, got, uh, we've supported privates uh, up to... Uh, up through NCO ranks and uh, first lieutenant. And we also have uh, Stallman is a, a colonel, I believe, and we're supporting his family in uh, a case right now. So we, we do support all ranks, uh, our enlisted, our officers. Uh, Major Matt Goldstein, he's probably one of the most senior officers that we're dealing with right now. Army West Point graduate, Army Special Forces. Uh, he's led... Uh, both Special Forces, Afghan National Army, and United States Marines in combat. Uh, this is an extraordinary warrior. So we support uh, Army, Navy, uh, Marines, Special Forces, MARSOC, the Marine Special Operations Command. And uh, we have not had any cases dealing with the Air Force. We've not had any cases dealing with the Coast Guard. Um, but uh, that's, that's where we stand right now. Most of the, the ground combatants, uh, and, and even the, the Navy officers uh, enlisted that we're dealing with, these are all ground combatants. They're Navy SEALs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I know that you have, I think, what, four Navy SEALs that are um, involved in this? Well, we have, uh, we have a few from uh, SEAL Team 2 that were uh, supporting their case, but we also have Eddie Gallagher, which is probably the, uh, the most publicized case right now. It's a Navy chief. Uh, Navy SEAL chief who's uh, presently in pretrial confinement has been so for several months. And again, his case hasn't even come to trial. And uh, there's also a lot of other SEALs related to that case that we're supporting as well. And uh, Bull, I, I had the um, honor to uh, interview uh, one of your uh, board of directors, and that was uh, attorney from Chicago, John uh, Mayer. And I uh, and he's working uh, on the case with uh, Anna Lawrence, whose uh, son is uh, First Lieutenant Clint Lawrence. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what John does and, and, and about that case. Yeah, John Moore is a, an incredible attorney. He handles all sorts of uh, legal cases. We were fortunate enough to get him to be on our board, and he helps provide guidance and oversight specifically to cases where – the, the amount of knowledge that's necessary is critical. And he ends up finding uh, ways of examining these cases that wouldn't ordinarily be looked at. The, uh, the biggest piece he has going on right now personally is what's called a writ of habeas corpus for Clint Lawrence. And this is Clint Lawrence's story. Uh, you know, young, hard-charging, prior enlisted, green-to-gold officer 
who uh, on his uh, third day with his platoon in Afghanistan, where he was put in there to replace the prior lieutenant who had been blown up, had his uh, abdomen, face, and eyes hit with shrapnel, medevaced out. Clint Lawrence goes in there to take control of his platoon and to engage the enemy. And uh, on his first combat patrol, all of a sudden, three Taliban co enemy combatants come speeding towards him on a motorcycle, which one of his soldiers engages, which was completely consistent with the rules of engagement. However, they missed. First Lieutenant Lawrence in, tells his heavy machine gunner on top of an armored vehicle to engage, ends up engaging with his machine gun, takes out two of the three. The third was able to get away. And this was all a part of a coordinated attack on his platoon. Of note, Clint Lawrence didn't even see these individuals heading towards his platoon. This was, again, a split-second decision that was made in the heat of combat while other parts of his platoon were being maneuvered against by other Taliban. And after the dust settled, the, uh, a report went up that uh, he had engaged civilians and killed civilians. The uh, prosecution held that he engaged and killed civilians. Uh, it was attempted murder and murder. And uh, he eventually was found guilty of this, despite uh, the fact that had the uh, U.S. Army looked into their database, they would have found that these were not civilians. They were enemy combatants. And this is where a gentleman like John Marr came on board, and he was able to reach back to Afghanistan and pull up the biometrics, fingerprint and DNA cells uh, that are normally lifted off of attacks when improvised explosive devices are used, and they can pull up fingerprints from little pieces that are left or even skin cells from uh, the enemy combatants, the bomb makers, as they're twisting wires, and they compile all this in a database, and lo and behold, these uh, so-called civilians who were uh, aggressively maneuvering towards Clint Lawrence's platoon, they, they were not civilians. These were enemy combatants. They were bomb makers. They would killed uh, Americans, maimed Americans prior, and Clint Lawrence made the right decision because of his split-second decision, American lives were saved, and yet he's now sitting in prison and uh, we're hoping that this whole case is going to be taken out of the military, brought into the federal legal system, which it already has. And uh, the federal judge there in Kansas has ordered that the United States government respond to some of these uh, inappropriate actions to include withholding what's called exculpatory evidence. Exculpatory evidence is when the prosecution knows that there's some evidence that will, sh that will support the defendant showing that perhaps they weren't guilty. The U.S. Army prosecutors decided to withhold this information. They withheld information that, number one, the uh, civilians, as they continue to refer to them, were enemy combatants. They withheld information that an Army report came out saying on that day that Clint's platoon was being engaged for either an ambush or an attack and it was a coordinated attack, and that report was buried. It was not brought to light in front of the jury. And finally, the jury wasn't made aware that nine of the individuals that testified against Clint Lawrence were actually charged with murder themselves, and then were told that they would be they would be they would not be charged with murder if they end up testifying, which is exactly what they did. And certainly if the jury was aware of all this information, we would have had a very different outcome. Instead of him being charged with 20 years in prison, the uh, convening authority knocked down, took it off one year, uh, but ultimately he was uh, confined and he's still confined right now in prison. Yes, and I know in, in talking with his mother, uh, I learned so much about this case. And, and when our guys are out there, they have to make split second uh, decisions but they also know who these guys are. And they've got, you know, a pretty good profile on who all the enemy are. And so uh, they're not going out and, uh, and uh, attacking civilians, like you say. So anyway, here's, uh, here's a, a real American hero, and he's in Fort Leavenworth right now. And, um, and what you're trying to do, is, and I know you're going to succeed, is uh, to get him uh, not only uh, freed from prison, but get him actually uh, to a point where he's not, not uh, pardoned or paroled, but he's found innocent. Exactly. And, and you know, here's, here's to, to layer on top what you're talking about, Bill, where 
our warriors, it's not like they just, you know, jump into this situation and start shooting people up. And a perfect example of this is Matt Goldstein's case, Army Special Forces. Here's an individual who leading uh, Afghan National Army, Marines, and Army Special Forces into some of the heaviest fighting that we'd seen in Afghanistan, who, who you know, knows the battlefield, knows the locals, interacts with them, and maintains a relationship with these people. And then all of a sudden, two United States Marines are killed uh, with an improvised explosive device and working with the locals, he's able to identify who that bomb maker is, goes out, picks him up, brings him in, and reports up that they've got this bad guy. And the higher headquarters are like, well, let him go. We've got, you know, what do you want us to do with him? They had no way of holding him where they were in Afghanistan, and he wasn't a big enough profile to send to Guantanamo Bay. And so Matt released him, you know, being a good soldier that he is and following orders. But at the same time, he realized that this individual now was going to exact retribution against those locals that helped to incarcerate him or to capture him. And so he laid it an ambush. This is a tactical uh, maneuver or a technique, TTP, tactic, technique, and procedure that United States military have been using throughout the war and throughout wars prior to this. And observed this individual coming back after the locals. And being the good warrior he is, he took him out. He killed this individual. And now all of a sudden, they want to try to find him guilty of murder. Again, it doesn't make sense. If, if he's guilty of murder, then, then just about every warrior in, these, in the past wars that have ever conducted an ambush uh, are also guilty. And so it's, it's, it's undermining the whole concept of how we fight wars. So you, you, uh, we started off, you originally talked about the Marines at Haditha, and I'm very familiar with that case. I, re I remember reading about it and studying it, uh, and, it was, and you didn't mention his name, but Congressman John Murtha, who was the one who actually uh, came out on uh, TV and, and in front of the press in the world and uh, convicted these guys before the, they even had a trial or, uh, or anything. It, it was just unbelievable. Is that what really kind of started this whole thing going where we we have so many more? Because I remember in Vietnam, uh, there was an Army Lieutenant, uh, Callie, who was accused of uh, killing uh, uh, Vietnam villagers. And uh, he mentioned uh, seven cases in World War II, uh, Vietnam, and uh, Korea. That was one of them. But now you're talking about 22 and, and another three, and that's just the ones that you're working with. Well, fortunately, I believe we're the only ones right now that are supporting these war cases. So I, I, although the numbers are huge, I, I think to the best of our knowledge, we're the uh, repository for all of these cases, and this is where best place to support them. But you're right, the Hadida case was what's, what triggered this for United American Patriots, and uh, the the, and, and for Major Donahue. But what you mentioned here with Congressman Murtha, this is a problem uh, on a strategic level. And this is where United American Patriots, we're fighting these tactical battles to support each one of these individual warriors, but there's a larger strategic battle that mes must be fought. And that's one of what's referred to as unlawful command influence, UCI. And this is where Congressman Murtha, as a congressman, is really imposing his, his authority and his will on a situation prior to due diligence taking place and prior to the individuals being assumed innocent prior to if they are found guilty. And what's really interesting is in the Uniform Code of Military Justice, we see this all the time where an individual, a senior individual, may impart this UCI, this unlawful command influence, and it can have a case thrown out, which that, that's appropriate and it should happen. However, in the history of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, there is not one reported case of the individual who actually performs this UCI, this unlawful command influence, being held accountable. And this is a serious problem because now these individuals can act with impunity. And it's not just the generals and the admirals. It's also the prosecutors. When they do something wrong, they are not held accountable. The case may be thrown out, 
which is good for the individual, but by not holding these individuals accountable, this is not good for the organization because it allows for people to do it again and again and again and have no risks associated with doing it. Why is that harmful? Because we don't know how many people are falling victim to this unlawful command influence and uh, these prosecutorial misconduct, which are beyond even these war cases. So anyone in the Uniform Code of Military Justice for whatever type crime is now falling into a situation where it's becoming lopsided against them. And that was not the intent of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. It was to find truth. It was tr to find what was right. It was to maintain good order and discipline for the organization, not to have these professional attorneys who are coming in, who have never served in combat, who are putting on uniforms, who are the generals and admirals are abrogating their authority and allowing them to run with these cases. And now all of a sudden, these individuals who their career is based upon their, the amount of prosecutions they have, that they're now racking and stacking bodies so that they could climb upon them for their next promotion. So there's really a, a larger strategic issue that must be addressed. Right now, we're down here in the day-to-day -day fight, but as we continue to move forward, we're going to be working towards future operations of adjusting this to make sure that all of our warriors are treated justly. Um. Yeah, obviously, that's that's what is what needs to happen. So, uh, can you tell us a little bit uh, more about some of the other cases you mentioned uh, uh, that that you Absolutely. have some others? Yeah, let, let's talk about one that uh, I I was fortunate enough and honored to testify on behalf of a uh, parole hearing just last week. Uh, Sergeant Derek Miller, outstanding individual, who uh, was. Uh, like most of these, these guys, they perform above what's expected of them. Army National Guardsmen who, you know, balancing life and service overseas. He goes overseas. Uh, this was not his first combat tour. It was his third. And while he's overseas, uh, identifies a Taliban scout coming through a defensive perimeter near their mortar position. And as anybody who's been in combat realizes that you know, you've got people looking around. They're, they're battlefield spies, if you will. And uh, this individual wasn't armed because the bad guys know our uh, rules of engagement better than we do. And they conform to them. And so they realize if they were carrying a weapon, certainly that's going to cause a problem. But if they're unarmed, we just assume that they're civilians. Well, this individual is coming around and s scoping out the positions that Derek was responsible for providing security. Derek pulls him aside and starts interrogating him to try and get some information out of him. And according to Derek and others at the time, the individual grabbed Derek's pistol and Derek shot him and killed him. Now, it's arguable whether or not a struggle ensued and whether or not Derek uh, acted in self-defense. But let's assume you know, the best case scenario that he acted in self-defense, well, then this was a justifiable killing. If in the worst case scenario that it was not self-defense, then it was certainly not, as he was charged with, premeditated murder. This is what he was charged with. And he was actually found guilty of premeditated murder. In the worst case scenario, he should have been charged with what's called voluntary manslaughter. Now, for those who are not familiar, why this is so important is premeditated murder came with an incarceration and sentence of life in prison, as opposed to voluntary manslaughter, which might have given him a sentence of, let's say, 15, 20 years. Why that's also really important is that a, a sentence of tw a life in prison doesn't come with this opportunity for parole, whereas this lesser sentence would have given him an opportunity for parole, where he would have been up for parole about three years ago. So this certainly was not premeditated murder. So this was a, 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 an inappropriate charge. Why this case, though, is even worse is that there were two potential witnesses at the time. One was a, uh, an interpreter who supposedly was going to tell exactly what happened. However, after being interrogated or having a discussion with CID, the Criminal Investigative uh, Command, that all of a sudden, his case 
seemed to change where he's like, well, I'm not really sure that there was a struggle. I'm not really sure that it was self-defense. And what's interesting is that somehow the CID people talked to him about him becoming a U.S. citizen and going back to the United States. So was there influence that was pressure or pressure put upon him to change his testimony? It's hard to say. We don't have those answers right now, but it's certainly a question as to why he did. He felt there was a struggle and then changed his testimony. The second was PFC Miller, uh, same last name, not a same relation, that apparently he also identified a struggle until all of a sudden CID again talked to him and said, well, perhaps you're actually an accomplice here. And you know what? Instead of going home uh, when your uh, National Guard tour is done, perhaps you're going to have to stick around here a little bit longer. And that means uh, you're going to miss your honeymoon. All of a sudden, guess what? PFC Miller's testimony changed. Yeah, I don't think it was a struggle. So there's a, there's a lot that comes into play here with this case. And, uh, you know, other questions arise, like why was Sergeant Miller charged with premeditated murder and given life sentence? There was only three other individuals who were given a life sentence. One was First Sergeant Hatley, who killed four individuals. Another was Sergeant Gibbs, who killed three individuals. And these were supposedly part of kill, kill teams that were going out and harming innocent civilians. Uh, and in pre in truly premeditated fashion, and then the third was uh, Staff Sergeant Bob Bales, who went out and killed 16 civilians, uh, men, women, children in, uh, in another in the Kandahar massacre, as it was referred to. So, why did we lump Sergeant Derek Miller into this same case and give life in prison? These are, these are questions that, that have to be asked and. Uh, I don't think they've been properly answered yet, but I do know with the support of United American Patriots, we've been able to reduce his life sentence down to 20 years, and we were able to get into a parole hearing just last week, and it seemed to go very favorably, and we hope to get him out of prison this year so he can go back home and be with his uh, two beautiful daughters as soon as possible. Well, Bull, that, that, that's really a, an amazing story, and I, I really want to thank you for coming on and, and uh, telling us some of these stories and telling us what you're talking about. And I can understand where, you know, you say you're fighting the tactical battles now, but we need to look at the strategic overall uh, issue of this. And it, everything that I'm getting out of this, it sounds more like we've got uh, we've got prosecutors who are more interested in themselves and uh, interested in the truth. And uh, it so doesn't sound like, we're giving our warriors the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing this, you know, and to circle back around to uh, Eddie Gallagher's case, you know, here, here's an individual where uh, he, he's in pretrial confinement. There's absolutely no reason for him to be in pretrial confinement right now. This is an absolute abuse, uh, and it, it limits his access to his attorneys. It limits his access to his family, and it limits his access to treatment that he was undergoing for traumatic brain injury. This is a guy who's had multiple combat tours, eight combat tours, and uh, you know, a warrior like this who's been highly decorated, a hero, you know, he needs to be treated with some dignity and some respect, not like some common criminal. And you know, we even see some of our our worst cases of uh, some of the most heinous actions that we're, we allow individuals to get out on bail or bond. Well, in the United States military, there is no such thing as bail or bond. So if the convening authority says, put them in pretrial confinement, they're in pretrial confinement, that's it. And you know, here's a case, you know, again, very similar to Derek Miller's case in that in uh, Mosul, where we were destroying ISIS, the Iraqi special forces, which, uh, we had Eddie Gallagher who was working alongside this Navy SEAL uh, and was recognized as, as a, a highly proficient and courageous warrior on the battlefield, but also a, a medical professional. And this is where it's important to understand because people try to, to paint Eddie out as this, this murderer. And uh, I think it's important to recognize that Eddie enlisted in the United States Navy to be a corpsman. This is a medical professional, an emergency medical technician, if you will, who serves alongside United States Marines. And he did with United States Marine snipers. He was so highly respected 
And Bill, you know this, that, you know, Marines, especially infantry guys, you know, it takes a lot to impress our, our warriors. Uh, they, they embraced this guy. They loved him so much that they, they actually allowed him to go through sniper school. And so here's a, a Navy corpsman whose profession is to save lives, uh, who went through sniper school and then eventually went back and applied to be a Navy SEAL. He was accepted, went through basic underwater demolition school and became a Navy SEAL, yet maintained his profession as a lifesaver. So here on the battlefield, you had some Iraqis who come in, they, they killed a whole bunch of ISIS, and they find this one individual who was still alive. Now, of course, the media makes it out to be a story of, oh, my God, he was 15 or 17 years old. He was just a child. Well, just for clarification, 15 to 17-year-olds will kill you just as dead as 20 to 30-year-olds. So this guy was a bad guy. There was no question about it. This guy was a, a hardened ISIS operative. He was a warrior. That's never come into question. So when they found this guy who was alive, they brought him to Eddie and said, Amy, Eddie, Keep this guy alive because we want to continue questioning him. We want to get more information out of him. And just like in Derek Miller's case, that the worst way to get information out of somebody is to kill them. It doesn't make sense. If you don't want information, you kill someone. If you want information, you maintain them and you keep them alive as best as possible. And that's exactly what Eddie did. That was exactly what Derek Miller tried doing. And so in this case, Eddie Gallagher tried keeping this individual alive. And unfortunately, he died. Now, more details are going to come out specifically with this case, but there's been conflicting testimony. Yet most of the testimony against Eddie Gallagher is hearsay, meaning I heard or somebody said they saw. And with most of these cases, almost all of these cases, there isn't hard evidence. And as you well know, if somebody's charged with murder, present the body, present the evidence. Let's do an autopsy. In none of, none of these cases does this happen. It's just an assumption. As a matter of fact, what the prosecution does, they line out the names of the individual. So we can't even try to find out who they are, but United American Patriots, we support our defense attorneys who do run this down, and they do do a good bit of homework to find out whether or not these people are bad guys. But in this case with Eddie Gallagher, you had this individual who's in Mosul where you know, tons of bodies were all over the place. Again, th these are not – People try and take this out of context and they try and put it into their own frame of reference and they say, well, you know, if I was walking down Main Street and something like this happened, well, of course it would be bad. Maybe or maybe not. But this is these cases are not happening in Main Street, USA. They're happening in the worst, most volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous environments in the world. And so it's not as clean as the prosecution tries to make it look. Everything's messy. Everything's a gray area. And so in this situation, Eddie Gallagher tried saving an individual's life. The individual ultimately died. And yet because you had some Navy SEALs who didn't like him, now he's being accused of murder. And, and just to backtrack it out, Eddie, who had had eight combat tours, who was very insightful, understood the battlefield and the dynamics very well, these charges are coming against him from some individuals who had never been in combat before. And so this was their, 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 their initiation to all of this. And certainly we're very shocked by the challenges that happened on the battlefield and taking life. That's not something that should be taken lightly, yet could very easily have misperceived things that were going on, could very easily be unsettled by a lot of these things that were going on. And because they were not performing up to standards, as Eddie has said, these were individuals who were frightened, which is not something you ever hear about a Navy SEAL being frightened. And yet Eddie Gallagher, this known warrior who's proven himself time and again, was trying to get these guys in line and tell them to step up and stop being, as he referred to, pussies, that all of a sudden now these guys, they had an ax to grind because they knew that the stories were going to go back that they didn't perform well. And you know, one, one of the big things on the battlefield that Marines, we tend to say to each other, is if you're ever in a firefight, don't act like a pussy. You might live. And so these guys lived. And when you go back and you've got to an answer, why weren't you nominated for some heroic medal, medal of Valor, which, as we all know, these are all subjective. But why, why are people saying you didn't perform? Well, it's easier to point fingers at someone else and say, well, they're bad, not me. 
And that's really where a lot of this case has uh, originated from in Eddie Gallagher's case. But that being said, the truth will come out. Yet until then, there's no reason for this warrior who has three children, a loving, supporting family, and needs medical treatment and access to his attorneys, there's no reason why he should be incarcerated right now in a brig at Miramar, San Diego. And so, as you say, the truth will come out, and uh, the reason the truth is going to come out is because of you and your organization, United American Patriots. So, Bull, it's been been so great having you on the show, and uh, your your stories are just fascinating, and uh, uh, I, I admire and respect you so much for what you're doing for uh, our, our nation's warriors uh, who really need uh, help. Well, thanks, Bill. I really appreciate what you're doing, helping to spread the word and letting everybody know about the challenges. And again, for all those who are watching right now, please go to United American Patriots. That's UAP.org and donate. All your support is tax deductible and it helps all of our warriors. But moreover, it preserves all of our rights. So all the support that we can get to help these warriors is greatly appreciated. Thanks so much, Bill. I really appreciate the time. You're welcome and thank you. Okay, I'm back uh, after a, a short break, and uh, I want you to really go to this website, United American Patriots. It's www.uap.org, and um, go through the website and re and read about uh, the uh, directors and uh, the people involved in this and the cases. It's really fascinating, and uh, we all really owe it to uh, help. Uh, these young uh, men, these young warriors who are being accused of uh, crimes that are not really crimes, uh, being accused of uh, doing things just out of political expediency and political correctness, uh, people trying to uh, build their own careers in, instead of looking uh, to uh, give our warriors the benefit of the doubt and, uh, and find the truth. So in talking about finding the truth, uh, also I want you to um, go to um, 2020 A Clear Vision for America where you can find the truth about a lot of things that are happening in America today. And I uh, would really appreciate every one of you um, go ahead and getting the book. And uh, even though this show is pre-recorded, I'm going to hold open uh, my offer of giving anyone a free book uh, who uh, writes to me and asks me for one. And all I'm asking you to do is just uh, defray my cost of shipping and handling of $5. So you get the book free. And um, that, that I can't think of anything that would be a more priceless gift for you to uh, give anyone else. So anyway, uh, God bless you all. And remember, uh, where there is no vision, the people perish. And when the American people have no vision, the American people will perish. So God bless you all. God bless our warriors. God bless those who are um, waiting to um, have uh, true, uh, the truth come out about what's happening to them. Uh, God bless our vets and uh, our Corps. And God save our America because we need you now more than ever before.